Have you ever met a man who saw a baby girl crawling on the floor and proposed marriage to her? Neither have I. Apparently, this is something that men just don't do. Now, imagine someone who's a religious authority proposing marriage to a baby. Imagine your pastor or priest or rabbi or imam seeing your six-month-old daughter and saying, I can't wait to marry her. Would you continue going to that church or synagogue or mosque? Men, answer me in the comments section. How many teeth would your pastor or priest or rabbi or imam still have in his mouth if he so much as suggested the possibility of marrying your infant daughter? What kind of man sees a baby and hears wedding bells? What kind of man hears goo goo gaga and thinks ooh la la? Only one kind of man. The kind who claimed to be the final prophet of the great god Allah. Ibn Asak, page 311. Ibn Asak recorded that the apostle saw her, Umm al-Fadl, when she was a baby crawling before him and said, If she grows up and I am still alive, I will marry her. But he died before she grew up. Lucky girl. Name one way this guy isn't the creepiest person who ever walked the planet. Muhammad saw a baby crawling in front of him and he said, if she grows up and I'm still alive, I'll marry her. Keep in mind that when Muhammad talks about a girl growing up, he's referring to the girl reaching the ripe old age of six. This girl never knew how lucky she was that her degenerate sleazebag of a prophet died an agonizing death before he could steal her childhood innocence and then die, leaving her a childless widow for the rest of her life, which is exactly what he did to Aisha. Notice the name in parentheses, Umm al-Fadl, that was added by the translator Alfred Guillaume, and it's apparently a mistake on his part. The baby was later known as Umm Habib bin Abbas. Umm al-Fadl was her mother. We know this because the same story occurs in Musnad Ahmed, and the baby is clearly identified as Umm Habib. In the history of At-Tabri, Umm Habib, the baby, is on the list of people to whom Muhammad proposed marriage but never married. What are our Muslim friends going to say about this? Well, it was a different culture. Back then it was perfectly normal to propose marriage to a baby. And perhaps Muhammad saw her and knew that she had a great memory and so he wanted to marry her so that she could preserve stories about him and be a blessing to the Muslim community. Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter what Muhammad did, it doesn't matter how horrifyingly disgusting his actions were, modern Muslims will explain it away by inventing some important reason Muhammad had for doing the horrifyingly disgusting things he constantly did. My Muslim friends, if your prophet were wonderful in all respects, but did one really creepy thing, I can see why you might give him the benefit of the doubt. But when all he ever did was creepy, perverted, violent things, I have to ask, what does a guy have to do to convince you to stop calling him the greatest man who ever lived? Your prophet, whom you regard as the greatest man who ever lived, proposed marriage to a baby and had sex with a nine-year-old girl and took the wife of his own adopted son and broke an oath he made to his wives that he would stop having sex with his slave girls and beat his wives, and allowed his followers to hire prostitutes, and beheaded hundreds of Jews, and tortured a man for money, and ordered his followers to execute anyone who leaves his religion, and tried repeatedly to commit suicide, and admittedly delivered revelations from the devil, and walked around covered in semen, and put his male followers on a strict schedule of shaving their pubic hair, and kissed a pagan rock, and bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves. And you call this guy the greatest man who ever lived? You might just as reasonably call him the greatest computer programmer who ever lived. Or the greatest tennis player who ever lived. Or the greatest yachtsman who ever lived. Because none of these titles make any sense when applied to Muhammad. If you wanted to call him the greatest sexual deviant of all time, or the greatest religious deceiver of all time, or the greatest destroyer of humanity of all time, you could make a pretty good case for your prophet in those areas. 
But don't call him the greatest man who ever lived, because that's an insult to every other man who's ever lived. When you call an egomaniacal, violent pervert the greatest man who ever lived, you're saying that every other man who ever lived is worse than an egomaniacal, violent pervert. And when you insult all men like that for the sake of the egomaniacal, violent pervert you call your prophet, you're inviting a response from the greatest false prophet mocker of all time. That would be me.